So what is the wooey? Um, and I think it's important when we're talking about the wooey that we all are on the same page about understanding what we're talking about. So when we say wooey, we mean the wildland urban interface. Um, this is the zone of transition between unoccupied land and human development. Okay, so here is an, an image showing homes, and then obviously there's rangeland directly adjacent to those homes and a wildfire approaching those homes because, you know, uh, most of these big wildfires that we have, especially in the West, um, are so impactful because they're happening in the Wui. And um, we certainly, that's that's why we care about the WUI. And that's why there are discussions about the WUI because it's it's expanding at such a rate that we're concerned about the increased risk to fire. So who lives in the WUI? As of 2020, uh, we don't have actual data up until now, but um, as of 2020, 9% of the land area in the lower 48 was in the Wui. But that land was home to more than 44 million homes, which is 32% of all housing across the whole US. And so this is a really important point to think about, right? Is that it's only 9% of the land area, but that's where 32% of the people live. Um, and this area continues to grow by approximately 2.4 million acres per year. So it's an it's, it's an ever expanding um, zone in the U.S. In Nevada specifically, 45 percent of the state is is in the WUI. Uh, we we saw a 67 percent increase in the WUI between 1990 and 2020. So that means that that area that we're identifying as that zone that's on the interface between the 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 wildlands and the development so it's expanding outward 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 um so in the last about 30 years we've seen a close to 70% increase in that total area within that area we have seen a 208% increase in housing development within the wuwi Right, so significantly more homes are being put in that area and, the, and that area itself is expanding. As you can see on the image here in the right, um, this shows risk to homes in the West. And as you can see, uh, there's a significant risk to homes all over Nevada in the North, throughout the Sierra and the West in general. And so if you're thinking about this, relative to kind of this this increase in space in the WUI and the amount of homes in the WUI, it just paints kind of a dramatic picture of the issue that, that we have in this region. Okay, this I thought was also an, another interesting way to look at it where you can see the percent change in the area in the wildland urban interface between 1990 and 2020. If you look at Nevada and other states in the Intermountain West, we're in that dark red zone, which is the 50 to 85% change in area. So an, an increase by over 50% in the movie, like I described in the last slide. Interest, interestingly enough, if you look at our neighbors to the West, California hasn't expanded as dramatically. I think it's just because California is already so developed out, right? And so they have significant wooey there, but it's already so developed that there, there's not much more room to push the edge of the wooey any more than they possibly can. Whereas in Nevada, we're still really pushing um, out into the wildlands a lot more and growing probably. So um, I think that was a error, but what I wanted to do was if I can escape this and stop sharing my screen. I had wanted to go and show you guys this really cool thing that I found online that actually shows by individual counties in Nevada how much of a change we've seen. So I'm just gonna reshare my screen here. I We couldn't figure out how to put it in the PowerPoint. So we're just gonna do it this way real quick. Um, so if I can zoom. 
appreciate your patience because this is a little bit clunky, but it's pretty cool. So if you look at this, you can see um, if we zoom in on the West, on Nevada, if it'll let me, you can see if we zoom, oh, come on, man. here we go. You can see here on this year front, we've had a 94% of the housing units in Story County are in the WUI. Uh, 94% in Lyon, 93% in the Mineral County area, 88% in the Douglas County area. So it just shows more fine grain how much of our homes are in the WUI in Nevada. 93% in Elko, 92% in White Pine. And so really just goes to show, and especially in this Sierra Nevada, Sierra Front region, Wow, we have like every we're all living in the Rui. I'm I I am too. I live in the Rui as well. So um that's a more fine-grained look at what we have going on here. Specifically about why this matters in Nevada. If you look at the history of statistics of when we get large wildfires in our state. What we see is that it's a combination of human caused and lightning. Um, in a lot of other states in the West, it can be really dominated by human caused. Um, there's just not as many humans in Nevada, which is why we like it so much. But we still do see, especially um, if you look at the later dates, that we are getting more human caused fires than lightning caused in the state, right? So if you look back to 2012, it was only 14% human caused, 2013, 7%, jumped to 2017 and 20, 2018, you have almost 40% human caused, and then in 2018, 60% human caused. So there are consequences to this expansion of the WUI and kind of this, this increase in the amount of people interfacing with the wildlands in which they live next to. So why are we talking about it and, and why is it important? Well, because in, in our program at, at UNR Extension and the Living with Fire program, we are really focused on preparing communities for wildfire and community safety and preparedness is a really big, big, big uh, piece of our overall all effort to make our communities better able to live safely with fire in this region. It, it, it also helps to mitigate the impacts of fire and the causes of fire if, if people understand Living in the WUI has this heightened risk and just understanding that fires are caused by, by humans in the WUI. So what, what can we do to lessen that? And then just to make sure that, that, that people understand, there's a lot of, um, of interagency cooperation and community engagement opportunities in the WUI that we can really, um, there's a lot of resources out there to help folks be better knowledgeable and prepared to live, to live safely in the movie. And so we just want people to, to understand that those exist. So, you know, going back to just why is this important and just talking briefly about the concepts of fire ignition and behavior. And so in, in order to start a fire, you need to look at the triangle on the left to kind of understand how that works. You need heat source, fuel, and oxygen, right? So those are the basic components that you need to start and sustain an actual fire, right? So if, if you get a human ignition with a spark from your vehicle, a cigarette butt, a campfire, um, a spark on a, from a gun on a bullet when you're out, uh, you know, in the range doing that, that's what, how you start the fire. But the way that the fire behaves depends a lot on the topography and the weather and the fuel on the landscape. Now we know in Nevada here, we have a lot of dramatic topography and we know that we get a lot of big winds, right? Fuels can include not only the sagebrush and the trees, but that also includes our homes. So when you think about it, homes are built out of a lot of very flammable materials and you're putting those on the edges of steep mountains that have a lot of wind, that's gonna influence how fires behave in this area as well, which is just something to keep in mind. 
So again, what if fuel, what if the fuels include homes, right? And so looking at these, these images, you can see here that we have a lot of examples where fires come right up to houses um, and, and the homes are interspersed in, in the areas where the fires could potentially start. So we recommend an approach to this that includes doing your defensible space and hardening your, your home. And if you want to learn more about that, we have a ton of different resources available on our website. We have videos you can watch from other webinars that we've done that will teach you more specifically about to do these things around your home if you're living in the WUI to make it more resilient to fire. But we're not talking about that specifically today. So here are just some examples of some, some areas where homes are were in are very much built in the Wui. Um, this this area was burned in a wildfire in Colorado. Um, here's an example of the Wui in Idaho. Um, and yeah, here's just some resources that we have available uh, for folks that live in the Wui. Uh, certainly, um, going to your local fire department or your fire district is a very useful resource to get a defensible space inspection, to learn more about how to live safely in the WUI. On our, our website, we have a map that, that links for each county in Nevada, and you can link on that to see where to go and who to contact in your county. We also have us, which is Living with Fire program, which you guys obviously know about because you're here today, but we have a ton of things online available for you. Uh, there's also the, the, the Fire Adapt in Nevada initiative, uh, that's managed through the Nevada Division of Forestry uh, with support from us and the BLM and all of the, the local agencies in Nevada um, and then these other national programs as well. So with that, um, I think that this is a good opportunity just to take some questions from the audience before we um, start a discussion with Augie. Yeah, we know that this was like kind of like a, a real quick intro to the WUI. We wanted to leave a lot of room for questions and discussion. So feel free to just hit us with what you got. Um, in while you guys are typing in your questions, I have a few questions for uh, Christine and Avi to get the yeah. discussion going. Um, so I would, I guess, what... Um, can you maybe expand on the interagency cooperation piece and describe and and talk about uh, the importance of that in the WUI um, and how that might that's unique to the WUI as opposed to like living in an urban area? Um, and I'll let either of you, whoever wants to go first, maybe. I can jump on that one first. Maybe um, Augie. The interagency piece is huge uh, in two main aspects. One is pre-fire in terms of how we can tackle like fuels management projects, help establish defensible space, home hardening, those kinds of things. Every agency has different resources available. So oftentimes it's finding the square peg for the square hole when there's a certain need with the communities. Um, case in point, uh, re locally Reno and Sparks don't have wildland divisions, but they have areas that are in the Louis. Uh, oftentimes we go into their jurisdictions to help um, with fuels management projects and those kinds of scenarios. Same with Nevada Division of Forestry has a lot of operational resources that they can use to implement defensible space. But another aspect of that are jurisdictional boundaries. Um, a lot of Truckee Meadows, WUI areas, uh, border federal land, Bureau of Land Management and Forest Service are our two big ones. Obviously, we can't just go on to Forest Service land and do fuels mitigation work, even though there might be a house 300 yards away. So working hand in hand with the federal governments, both in terms of how are we going to fund that type of work and making sure that we're meeting all the environmental requirements like NEPA, Endangered Species Act, those kind of things, um, is key for us to make a bigger impact across the landscape before the fire comes. When the fire actually happens, when we, when we get our big catastrophic wildland fires in the WUI, and I have the fortune or misfortune of being on every single one from Carson to Doyle in the last 20 years. Um, there is no agency in the world that has the 
suppression resources to be able to be effective in those scenarios. And so Truckee Meadows specifically, and this is pretty standard along the Sierra front, um, we have over a dozen mutual aid agreements with all of our counterparts up to the national level, where when we get a really bad fire, we can pull resources from Maine if we need to, if it goes that long. Um, case in point there, we had a fire a couple of weeks ago, the Hill Fire just outside of Verdi. It was a windy night. It started in the wildland and it threatened some structures for sure. It was only 50 acres. We were able to knock it down. But within two hours, we had over a dozen agencies operational on the, on the ground. Um, and that piece is key. Otherwise, any agency that had that type of fire uh, would get overran and simply not be able to cope with it. So those are the two, two key parts for, in my brain. Pre-fire for fuels management and home hardening, post-fire or during the fire for actual suppression. Perfect. That's any, exactly oh yeah, go ahead, Christina. I was going to say, any, any insights from folks in the, the audience about, you know, their um, what they've seen living in the WUI or if, if other folks work at, at agencies? Yeah, feel free to unmute your computer and speak up, or you can type into the chat if, the, if you're more comfortable with that. But we know that there's probably folks in the room who are community leaders and have experience working with agencies. And if you have any knowledge to share, um, we would. this is definitely an opportunity for that. Um, I had, uh, I, I want, I, I kind of wanted to maybe take a step back and for the folks, maybe pull up that PowerPoint presentation again and look at some of those WUI examples. And it'd be yeah. really interesting to hear from Augie's perspective, um, like looking at some of these communities, just from pointing out some of your concerns. Cause we, we talked about the, the, the wildland fire behavior, like the, the the things that drive a wildland fire. And then maybe that can maybe drive home the point of why, of how fire behaves in the Louie. Yeah, this is a great one. So like, for example, like as a firefighter, um, what do you, and you're looking at this, what it, what's going through your mind? Okay, um, broad overview. I'm not familiar with, where where is this one taken? I think it's this in Waldo Colorado. In Colorado. I was not on this fire. I think this was Arizona, if I remember right. Was it? I it's in, pretty sure it's in Colorado, like okay. the Colorado Springs area. Yeah. Okay. Um, but just brief, you know, initial, initial look at this community. I'm not a big fan of any of their defensible space. They do have some defensible space, especially the homes on the left. Um, but there is vegetation encroachment up within say 15 feet of a lot of those homes. Some other stuff that jumps out in terms of the, our fire, our wildland fire tra triangle, right? Our weather, our fuels, our topography. They're on a fairly steep slope. Fire likes to run faster and hotter uphill. So a fire approaching from the right of the screen, I'd be more concerned about than a fire approaching from the left of the screen. They are also, they are also in what looks like a kind of drainage where that kind of follows that cut bank in the back where the road is. Fire also likes to funnel up drainages. So that would exacerbate the heat and intensity of a fire coming from the right. On top of that, it's hard to tell, but looking where the sunshine is in the upper right-hand corner, I would assume that so we're looking, kind of looking east. This is an assumption, which would mean that that, that slope on the right that's getting the sun exposure is a southern aspect and aspect is at at play for us because since we live in the northern hemisphere the southern aspect is always receiving heat from the sun all day so there's less moisture and those fuels are more more viable for fire um, all of those things initial glance not knowing the details all of those things would make me more concerned about a fire approaching from the right of the screen than the left of the screen. And I would focus in terms of what a, the community should do. I would be more worried about them. Uh, let me back up. We have our, we follow the living with fire standards in terms of zone zero from the edge of the home out five feet and then five to 30 to 50, depending on uh, their hazard rating and then zone two further out than that. Hang on. 
Um, I would, for this community, say those zones are probably appropriate uh, facing us and on the left side of the homes, the way we're looking, but those distances should be increased to the right, if that makes sense. So rather than zone zero being zero to five feet on the right of the structures, in terms of how we're looking at them, I would say that zone zero should probably be 10 to 15 feet. And that zone one should probably go out to at least 50 feet and so on and so forth, rather than a donut circle around it, making it an oval, just due to yeah, the unique yeah. characteristics of the site of the neighborhood. Yeah. And so just to piggyback off of, you were talking about kind of like what the community can do. I think we're toggling back and forth between um, like the community res mm -hmm. working together and then maybe like individual responsibility of the homeowners. I did want to, um, oh, some, before I move on to that, we did have a, a comment. Janice was saying, it seems that um, access might be an issue in this community as well. I would agree, it's hard to tell, uh, but it looks like dirt road access in the back, um, which isn't ideal. Uh, it looks fairly straight though, so we wouldn't have to necessarily worry about our big structural firefighter it, firefighting engines being able to access it. Um, so hard to tell based on this picture, but that that is absolutely a concern that we would be looking at, as well as is it one way in, right? Um, does it end at the does the road end at the houses, or is there another way out out the left of the screen? Yeah, and so the access is an issue for two reasons, right? Because you want the residents to be able to get out. And Correct. then also you want apparatus and firefighters to be able to get in to defend yep. the community. And from the um, evacuation standpoint, these kind of roads we're not fans of because when the fire's coming, obviously it's dark, it's smoky, visibility's crummy. Um, if you end up with one vehicle off the side of the road or one accident, then there, there is no way out, right? Yeah, I do want to acknowledge, I, someone mentioned, mentioned me, uh, just messaged me directly. I do... Some residents did die in this fire, which is very tragic. So I did want I do want to acknowledge that, and uh, um, just in case anybody is familiar with the area, um, we're just we're just doing this for training purposes. But you know, there there definitely are real dangers when it comes to these circumstances. Um, the I feel like we kind of touched on the things that I was wondering about when it comes to like the evacuation access oh yeah um what about like if i'm live if if i'm living in the wooey we all christina mentioned you live in the wooey <laughs> augie i think you live in the wooey like what is the uh what in from your perspective like could you define like the responsibility that comes with from living in the wooey christina you want to go or yeah, totally. Um, you have two yeah, so I, in the wooey. I live on yeah, I do actually. Um, I live on four acres in sagebrush rangeland ecosystem. Um, so sagebrush, a little bit of bitter brush, rabbit brush, all the things that give people allergies, including me. Um, but we're on big lots, so we have a lot of kind of wildland interspersed with us where we're right on the, the Sierra front. So we're really close to the edge of the peaks. And um, we definitely have a lot of defensible space around our, our home. There's a lot of wind here. And so we just feel like we need to have cleared a lot of, of area around the home. So we have a mix of rock and concrete in the zero to five foot zone. And then from five to 30, it's rock and irrigated turf. And then beyond that is sagebrush. And we ha have, we are not great at thinning out the sagebrush in that zone too, just because it introduces so much cheap grass. So, and also um, other, weeds that are an issue too. So uh, we have, have opted to uh, trim some of the sagebrush to be like shorter in some areas, but for the most part, we've really focused on that 30 feet within the home. And it's really more like 45 feet for us. Um, and then beyond is kind of that sagebrush area. Um, for home hardening, our house is stucco. 
Uh, we have not enclosed our eaves, <clears throat> so our eaves are open. So that's a point that's pretty, pretty vulnerable for us. But um, overall, I give us a B minus on our defensible space, or maybe a A minus on defensible space, B minus on home hardening. But I, me and my husband both work in in the fire world, and I feel pretty confident that our house would still be standing after a fire. Mainly because I think that what well, we did get evacuated in the Tamarack fire in 2021. So we definitely had to come face to face to that issue. And um, I feel like our house might do OK, but that's mainly because we've just we've got no big trees around the house, everything like that. It's real cleared out. Um, the other thing is just talking to our neighbors. Some of our neighbors definitely have a lot of trees close to their house because they want it for the windbreak and the shade. And some people have the notion that, you know, it doesn't matter. My house is just going to burn down in a wildfire anyways. So why should I do that? And I just fundamentally don't believe that to be true. The, the data and the research just don't show that. They show that if you have hardened homes and defensible space, that your home uh, will be more likely to withstand intrusion from embers and flames in a wildfire. Um, also, I think that more of us are woefully underinsured than we like to admit. And if you think about actually, you know, just the, the concept of that's what insurance is for. Yeah, if you have enough, um, insurance coverage insurance is becoming incredibly expensive and you know to and the rebuild costs are incredibly expensive the cost of lumber and things like that are so expensive that i worry that it would take a while to have my house rebuild and you only get loss of use for one year on your home right and then you're paying out of pocket to live somewhere while your house is being built and that stuff just scares me. So, um, yeah. so we try to take that pretty seriously. Um, and yeah, so that's, and insurance companies are pulling out of the WUI areas. It's happening at alarming rates. Um, and the rates are going up like crazy for us. And so, you know, we, ha we have a mortgage, we don't own our house outright, so we have to have insurance. Um, so we just try to balance that. Um, Augie, yeah, curious about yeah, same. I, I heard you kind of like, I feel like when I'm out and at events talking to folks, you brought up a few points that I hear a lot. And I'm, yeah, I like that we're kind of like debunking these ideas a little bit of uh, people thinking that insurance will just pay for their house to be rebuilt. Insurance also doesn't cover landscaping and that people invest a lot of money in their landscaping. Um, but yeah, Aug Augie, um, could you talk a little bit of maybe like touch on those things that Christina said, but also talk about how like houses, how if a house fire starts, like if the ignition source is the house, like if someone's still, like if they just have a normal house fire and it starts in the wooey, what could be the potential consequences of that? Uh, the, the short answer is whether it starts in the home or whether homes just become involved from a wildland fire that can easily become the driving factor behind the fire. Um, like I said, I've been on pretty much all the big wooey fires on the Sierra front for 20 years, and I have lost count of how many homes, I mean, it's hard to tell in that chaos, but how many homes look like they've burnt because the house um, downwind has been blowing embers towards them. Not necessarily the fuel or the wildland fire, but the other home that's 300 feet away and the ember wash from that. In terms of what I would say is important from the homeowner's perspective or what I would expect, what I would like to see out of homeowners, that would be, um, I would say, an awareness and, and some ownership. The awareness piece is realizing that if, if you don't take it seriously, if you don't at least attempt to, to help with the situation, you're putting um, my folks' lives at risk. We train, we try to beat it into new guys' brains that, you know, no ho no house is worth risking your life for, and we won't take any extra risks because of homes being involved. It's complete BS, right? Because there's the human element, and obviously emotion plays into it, and 
you care more about saving somebody's home and their life than just a pile of brush or some trees. So we do take more risks, regardless of what anybody says, uh, when homes are involved. So some awareness of that. And then the ownership piece, I interact with a ton of folks, the ownership at the baseline, I interact with a ton of folks that uh, they want me to come out, look at their home and then give them black and white things they can do to make their home safe. And I tell them it's kind of a spectrum, right? There is nothing that you can do to be perfectly safe. And there's, but some, everything that you do is better than nothing. Um, so the ownership of, I'm choosing to live in the WUI, and I've lived in the WUI my entire life, been evacuated numerous times. I'm choosing to live in the WUI. I cannot expect that a fire agency is going to show up and guaranteed be able to save my home. Like it is just a risk that you take. If, if, if you're that worried about it, then the only place to live is downtown Las Vegas. In <laughs> and <laughs> that is the only way to say your house will not burn down in a wild fire. And that hard truth is a tough pill for a lot of folks to swallow. And we even saw, you know, um, but sometimes I think, well, Midtown Reno, but the nuns and the tubs fires that occurred in um, Sonoma, Napa area in 2017, I believe is when that was. Um, the fire jumped Highway 101, which is a which is a four lane interstate um, in that region. And um, I went there on a work trip to see the aftermath. I mean, it's a residential community mm -hmm. in the middle of an urban area. So if if you if you get the winds that line up in just the right way, um, you know, if even if a small urban center, um, which we know is a relatively small urban center, you know, if it's close enough and you get those downslope winds, that all happened in the middle of the night, right? And was um, a lot of these big fires, um, Paradise Fire, you know, these these big fires there, they happen at night. Um, and that can be really scary because, you know, you get those evening winds and then it can push it into a more urban area. It can quickly move from the wildland urban interface into the urban. So important to not take that for, for granted. Um yeah, a great a great see, example of that, if I may, here. Yeah. Um, when we had uh, the little valley fire come off the mountain, it's spotted across Washoe Lake. Um, and we often have those during, and especially when we have cold fronts moving in on the Sierra front, we get our 70 and 80 mile an hour wind events and we haven't gotten our first big winter storm yet. We often have fires that penetrate deep into the urban areas. Um, people often think, oh, I'm, you know, a mile from the edge of the, the built up area. And in those scenarios, it doesn't matter. Oftentimes it's the winter time, irrigation has been turned off because pipe the, the lines will freeze. So you think you have, oh, I have green herbaceous plants. That doesn't matter because they've gone dormant. They're no longer transpiring moisture. They're available for consumption. And we frequently get fires that can penetrate deep hundreds and hundreds of yards into the quote unquote urban area. Yeah, absolutely. I see there's a note here from, from John Prune. I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name. As a landscape architect, I can often find it hard to balance the aesthetics and fire department desires. I think that is an interesting point because I feel like folks who, one of the things that people like about living in the WUI is also access to the outdoors and maybe nature and the plants and the trees, and they don't necessarily want to just cut everything down. So there's a, there's a bit of a balance. Do you guys have anything to say about like that balance? I mean... I I will say um, that, you know, there's a lot of, of plants and, and th there's a lot of aesthetic options of, of plants that are, you know, junipers are the worst, right? So, you know, th those, those highly resinous evergreen shrubs, planting those right next to your house, that's just, a, that's just always going to be a bad idea. There's never going to be a scenario in the wildland urban interface in, in the fire prone wooey, right? That's different than like living on the coast where actually the coast can burn a lot too. That's what happened that there's been a lot of big giant fires on the coast also, but especially where we are, those plants are not recommended in 
within 30 feet of your home, I would say. In the zero to five foot zone, you really, really want to be having no plants at all. Or if you do, low growing, high moisture content plants. Things like bulbs. Bulbs are beautiful. They they bloom and then you can cut them back in in the drier season. So thinking about lilies or tulips or things like that. Um, and succulents, you know, there are a lot of different succulent species that, that do quite well and don't take very much water. So for, for both, you know, the issues with fire and the water issues, those are, are great. And then, you know, as you move beyond into the five to 30 and beyond zone, thinking more specifically about just lean, clean, and green, right? So having space in between plants. So it's lean, making sure that you clean out all of the dead shrubs and, and leaves and that you have live uh, plants in there. So removing everything dead, irrigating it, if that makes sense where you live, but just kind of really thinking about how can you leverage plants that aren't super, that aren't as flammable. I mean, all plants are flammable, but how can you leverage that um, to make something look pretty? Um, you know, certainly we suggest broadleaf trees, um, things like aspen or maple or other sort of like broadleaf shade trees are definitely going to be less of a fire risk than again, junipers and things like that. Obviously, you know, the pine trees are native in this region, right? So having those on the landscape is 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 great, just as long as they're limbed up, right? So you you limb the dead limbs, don't limb more than one third of, of the total tree height because that's not safe for the tree. Um, and cleaning all of the needles, right? So we're not recommending that we denude the landscape. In fact, that's a bad idea. That can lead to erosion, that can lead to cheatgrass. Right. But it's it's this balance between, you know, let's err on the side of things that aren't so flammable. Let's give them some space. Let's not put them right next to the house. Let's not put them under eaves and under windows. But let's figure out, you know, um, if we're going to have a fence around our property, let's not attach the wood to the house. Let's not trellis plants along the fence. There are a lot of stories of fires moving from one house to the next via the wooden fence, right? So just, just trying to think about the behavior of a fire, the landscape in which you live, um, and things like that. Do you have anything to add? August, about I don't that? know if you have anything. Yeah, do you have anything to add, August? No, I would just say incorporation or or asking the questions with the local agency for because every every site is unique, right? Like Christina just talked about the pine trees on the landscape here. Uh, most people see a, a needle on the tree and they think it's a pine tree, right? But we, the broader term, it's a conifer. They're, the different species are unique too, right? We have, along the Sierra front, we have a lot of white fir. White fir loves to burn. It doesn't shed its lower branches. Pitch tubes are on the outside, super flammable. Whereas a Jeffrey or a Ponderosa pine, the yellow pines are way more fire resistant. So a Jeffrey or Ponderosa pine in zone one, I would say it's okay if it's lim limbed up. I, if it's a white fir, I'm saying get rid of it, even if it is limbed up. So there's a lot of nuance for very specific site or site specifics, if you will, that I would say, if you don't have the subject matter expertise, asking those questions can help a lot too. 